Uh, welcome to this session. Um, again, for those who attended Bernard's session, this, this session nicely complements that. Uh, the focus here is going to be on uh, OFI support for accelerators. I'll, I'll go over the terminology and the usage later. And as part of that, we have developed a software hardware framework, a proof of concept using Intel's Statix 10 FPGAs, which validates these extensions and it runs at 100 gigabits per second. And um, uh, because the focus is more on the OFI extensions, we are not going to be showing the performance data here. But uh, everything that Bernard said about FPGAs being first class citizens is, is, is equally applicable to our work. So just wanted to uh, thank Bernard for actually giving them, um, I mean, for, for the session to actually follow his session. Um, and I want to acknowledge all my colleagues at Intel, Olivier and Mike have joined as well as Andre, Patrick and Sean. Uh, so by the way, the, the proof of concept that we are going to be describing is, uh, is not an official Intel product. It, it, it's a proof of concept at this point in time. Uh, next slide, you can skip the next slide as well as the problem statement and go to the uh, subsequent slide. Thank you. Uh, so I mean, the, the, the term network is a, this D computer. I mean, I'm, I'm sure everybody has heard that. It was coined by John Gage probably maybe 30 years ago. Uh, so, so the concept is that the network is the focal point of the computation. So the, the computational resources are like just spread out across this network. And it, it's the network that binds them all to provide scalable performance. So that's, that's, that's pretty much what that concept refers to. Um, and and it's 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 still applicable today. There's, there's no change. And now that accelerators are playing a significant role in compute, um, along with general purpose CPUs, accelerators have to be tightly integrated with the network communication. So that's that's going to be key key to scalable performance. So this this slide shows the trend in terms of supporting this direct network interface to the accelerator, moving beyond uh, providing a network interface to CPU, and then eventually. The, 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 the tight, there's going to be tighter integration of CPU, general purpose CPU, accelerator, network interface. So all this boundary is going to be eventually blurred. So it doesn't really matter in the long run as to who would own the network interface, whether it's the CPU or GPU. But but the basic concept is that it, it is going to be uh, it's going to be the building block for this network as the computer uh, 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 usage model. Uh, so, so, so in any case, uh, exposing these accelerator cap capabilities that involve networking using standard APIs is extremely important. So before we get into that, I just want to make sure I explain the terminology that we use for the accelerators. So accelerators in this context, uh, in the context of communication can be uh, classified as uh, say inline, uh, which is some people call it as bump in the wire, where as you are sending and receiving the data, you can actually perform acceleration on the fly. And then the other option is to something called look aside where uh, the, the, the computation itself perhaps cannot be performed on, I mean, at wire speed. So you would do it separately. And then the outcome of the computation can then be used to send across the wire. And there you could have a discrete model where it could be a GPU or it could have something which is integrated on the NIC itself uh, where it's highly programmable. So, so, so pretty much it, it, it's something which is standalone. So that's the that's the basic idea. So the next slide uh, clarifies it um, in, in somewhat uh, greater detail. So here uh, we, we are again talking about these different types of accelerators. So what this uh, the slide shows is uh, uh, the concept of what is inline, what is look aside, and how it can be invoked both locally as well as in a remote sense. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, some some compute entity will want to transmit data. So the inline accelerator will be used to perform the compute on the data. So you can think of it as a streaming model. And then there's a look aside that I, that I mentioned where the, the computation is performed, but the data itself, the outcome of the look aside acceleration, whether it's done by a GPU or whether it's done by something in this accelerate, smart NIC accelerator domain, that data can be directly transmitted through the network port to a target. So, so that's, that's, that's the basic uh, two accelerator models that we are gonna be assuming for the rest of the discussion. Now, this accelerator block can either be invoked locally. In other words, as you are sending and receiving the packets, you may want to perform this acceleration during the course of transmit or, or possibly during the course of the receive operation. Additionally, you can actually invoke this acceleration remotely. I mean, some, I mean, I'd like to call this as a triggered accelerator mode where the packet ends up triggering that acceleration and that acceleration could be both an inline acceleration or a look aside acceleration. So the, the beauty of this is that this remote remote mode of acceleration can allow the target to be headless. So it, which means that 
you don't really need to have a CPU or an operating system involved here. And actually, it ties nicely with what Bernard mentioned earlier about FPGAs can be serverless and it can be used for hosting some function or microservices. So that's a, that's a very good usage model here. Um, but there are a lot of interesting things that you can do with this model as well. But but the, the bottom line is that everything looks fine and dandy, but what's the API for exposing these different types of accelerator modes to middleware and applications? And that's where the focus is going to be. So if you could go, please go to the next slide. So this is a standard picture that has been decorated with some of the additional things that we have done. So, so this, this is a standard OFI stack. Uh, so what we are talking about here is to use OFI and then extend it for supporting this different type of accelerators, the inline, look aside, and to, to, to invoke it both locally as well as in a remote fashion. Um, th there have been certain I mean, additional work that has been done in terms of taking, say, uh, OpenCL, for instance, and then uh, using pipes to go beyond a single node. And in this context, actually, the, the OpenCL uh, uh, model actually uses FPGAs. Uh, it allows kernel pipelining. You can do kernel-to-kernel -kernel communication between FPGAs, but it's it's not really a scalable solution. It's it's actually a probably probably more you know, logical to take a network API and then use it for supporting acceleration, which means that you can actually get a true scalable model. Uh, so with, with this approach, then the OFI would have some certain extensions that, that, that we are going to be talking about. And there are a couple of ways where uh, it can be exposed to the upper layer software. So for instance, as you can see in this picture, there's a lot of middleware which uses OFI. So the middleware themselves can transparently use these acceleration functions without actually exposing it to the upper layer software, the application, for instance. So the applications themselves will not be seeing these accelerators. But, but 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 the uh, middleware can make use of it. So there are a lot of areas in MPI, for instance, or Shmem, for instance, where it could benefit from certain accelerator support, and that's that's part of our pathfinding work that, that's ongoing. Um, now there's also an option where the application themselves can directly use OFI. So so that's that that's a way where you can actually make use of these extensions directly and then get the full benefit of the underlying. Uh, accelerator model. So, 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 so overall, even though we have done this in the context of FPGAs, the work is completely agnostic to FPGAs. It's just like what Bernard mentioned about the stack, pretty much abstracting away the FPGA functionality and letting anybody to use the, I mean, the TCP sockets interface. In the same way, the OFI interface provides pretty much the abstraction layer and under, under the covers, whether it's an FPGA or whether it's an ASIC, it's completely irrelevant. So that's 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 sort of the takeaway from this slide. So now, yeah, there is a question. Uh, the question is, where you know, this is an abstract layer understood, but is there any performance difference with and without this abstract layer on an FPGA? Uh, the abstract layer is OFI, and then I, I, can you hold on to the question? We'll go into the, uh, the details okay. of software architecture, and there is a there is a hardware abstraction layer which is below the OFI layer where we can talk about it. Um, so if you could please hold off, hold on the question. Unfortunately, I don't have performance data in, in this presentation um, because, I mean, the focus was mostly on the OFI extensions, but I'd be glad to provide the additional data if you're interested. So, so if you could move to the next slide. Um, so, so to test this concept out, uh, we, 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 as I mentioned, we build a hardware prototype. So, so this, this is just to rephrase what I was mentioning earlier. So we, the hardware vendor specific implementation is what we have done. So we have defined a mechanism by which how to specify the input output acceleration parameters and how to invoke the acceleration, whether you do it locally or whether you do, do it remotely and extending the communication framework to support these different types of acceleration functions. And then the API itself is what we're talking about for OFI. So this whole thing is based on this hardware prototyping, which is FPGA based. So if you can the next slide. So this prototype that we have that we have developed is is a is a SmartNIC accelerator integrated framework. Uh, it's called COPA. It stands for Configurable Network Protocol Accelerator. And as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, it's a POC and not a prod. So so the COPA work is actually can be broken into two phases. The first phase provides a baseline model. It provides the standard functionalities like probably already may put put the get based communication. And it provides all necessary infrastructure where accelerators can be invoked as part of the communication. And then, the, the, of course, there's a software support as well as part of it where you use OFI to expose it to the uh, 
upper layer software, which is like applications or middleware. Uh, and, and the hardware itself is, is layered upon uh, standard IP uh, Ethernet. The transport is something which we have developed to support this put get based communication model, and it supports both reliable and end to end um, unreliable mode of communication. And currently, as I mentioned earlier, we have it working at uh, 100 gigabits per second. And, and the second phase of this work is to take this infrastructure, take this framework, and then start customizing it depending on the usage that you're targeting. So there are like different customers, different applications that could actually take this and then adapt it and provide the necessary accelerator blocks that are needed. Which would make it run faster. So, so they're not going to be going into that in this discussion. Uh, next slide, please. So, this this picture uh, puts, uh, provides, provides the different system components that we have in place where where Copa is functional. So, uh, there are three, there are three 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 different types of FPGAs that we support. Uh, as you as you look at the top left, uh, it's a standard PCA attached FPGA. Uh, where uh, you have a currently it's it's a PCA based interface, but eventually we can move to a CXA based interface. So it attaches to a, a Xeon platform, and uh, this uh, the the OFI stack here would run on the on the Xeon, and then the rest of the hardware transport accelerator everything would run on the FPGA itself. So so pretty much this is going to be one of the component system con component, and as you move to the uh, right side, you have an FPGA SOC model where there is no need for a, 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 I mean, a, a separate a Xeon processor which attach, attaches to the FPGA. Instead, we make use of the integrated ARM that's available in, 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 in a standard static 10 FPGA, and that would end up running the OFI stack. So the software stack is, I mean, obviously, everybody on the call knows that OFI is very portable depending on, uh, depending on the hardware platform. You pretty much have to write a different provider or, or change, so have minimal changes to the underlying uh, hardware provider, so we have, we have been able to port it to this platform as well. And so, so from a from a usage point of view, it's no different. The same application can run both on the Xeon as well as on the FPGA SOC with absolutely no change, and we have validated it. Then there is something called a headless node, which is where there is really no no need for running a OFI stack. So here is the case where you can actually invoke the accelerator, like trigger the accelerator through the network. And then and then and then get the operation done on this remote FPGA. So this this as as, as we saw in the earlier talk, this con conforms to this serverless function or possibly hosting microservices um, model here. And and as I mentioned earlier, all this works on a standard 100 gigabit Ethernet. So we have used 100 gigabit Ethernet switch here, no change whatsoever. And then it uses standard IP UDP based protocol. And the, the only part is that what we have layered on top of it, a bit layered on top of IP. To provide our custom transport. Next slide. So this is a very high-level overview of the uh, hardware stack that we have put in place. So you can think of this hardware architecture as a combination of a of a NIC as well as accelerators integrated onto the FPGA. So so currently, as as the picture shows, inline blocks, inline accelerator blocks can be invoked directly on both transmit and receive operation. Um, there's also a look aside accelerator blocks that we have implemented. You can think of it as a proxy for, say, a discrete GPU or whether it's a integ integrated accelerator in a smart NIC. It doesn't matter, but it 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 it, it serves the purpose of providing this look aside accelerator blocks, and that can be then invoked. Currently, it can be invoked independently. So there's a little bit of software help that we have where software ends up uh, posting it into the look aside accelerator queues, and then the result of that operation. Is still kept inside the FPGA memory, and then it's directly transmitted to the uh, to the to over the network. So we will discuss some of the OFI extensions for inline and look aside invocation later. Uh, so so that's that's sort of the basic idea. I don't want to get into this hardware architecture in detail, but this should give you a good idea of what is there inside the hardware stack. So let me move on to the overview of the software stack, and hopefully this would answer the other question. If not, uh, I, I can we can revisit it. If you could please go to the next slide. So, so this one uh, gives a summary of the different components of the software stack. So, the I mean, I already talked about the FPG hardware piece of the uh, uh, solution. So, so moving beyond it, 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 it from a from a usage point of view, it acts like a standard device. So, you have a you have a Copa device driver, which does. The standard functions which a normal device driver would do, including mapping CSRs and command queues and whatnot. 
Um, so there's a lot of end-to-end -end reliability communique connection table set up also that the device driver does. So by the way, this is not going to be on the critical path. So once all the establishment and the setup is done, the upper layer software can directly use it and have a kernel bypass. Now there is a hardware abstraction layer called library COPA hardware or libchw that we have layered on top of this device driver. And this is the main system programming interface. So, so the OFI provides a next level of abstraction that allows all the middleware to run, but internally we have our own abstraction layer. This is as close as it can get to the hardware. And uh, everything that OFI ends up, I mean, OFI ends up invoking the this, uh, uh, I mean, the COPA hardware library for all its functions. So uh, we have done some measurements um, that, that I'm not showing in this uh, presentation where the difference between um, COPA hardware library and the OFI provider for COPA, there is, there is a bit of a difference, but it is not very, it's not significant. Um, so, so pretty much we are able to capture most of the performance at the OFI layer itself. Uh, so then going beyond the OFI provider for COPA pretty much is the interface to the external world, which completely shields all the uh, idiosyncrasies of, of the underlying hardware and the underlying provider, I mean, uh, uh, get functionalities and every application and middleware ends up using this OFI interface. And then of course, finally, the applications middleware are the, as the top layer and they pretty much are completely uh, blind or agnostic to what the underlying hardware is. So this is, this is, the, this is the overview of the full stack. Uh, does that answer the question that was raised earlier? Yeah, the question was um, with this abstract layer, if there is an FPGA underneath, is there a performance um, difference that you can talk about? Yeah, the, the, the fact that there's an FPGA underneath or whether it's an ASIC underneath is, is completely hidden, unless I'm misunderstanding the question. So the, uh, the, 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 uh, the low level library, the hardware library is, is the window to this underlying hardware device. So in terms of, Programmability in terms of the performance, you're not going to see I mean, more improvements by programming directly and, and using the FPG interface directly. I mean, so, so in terms of the comparison, there's, there's really no standard API for us to use the FPG hardware at this point in time where we can actually have communication also as part of the, uh, part of the interface. Okay, makes sense. Thank you, Venkata. Right. If there are other questions from the participants, please feel free to submit those through the panel or even raise your hand. Um, I do want to keep this interactive. So, yep, looking forward to those. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. So, so, so this, 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 this should give you like a quick, um, I mean, or at least a reasonable high level overview of the, of the framework itself of what we are doing. Um, in, in the interest of time, I had to rush through everything, but all the slides will be distributed, so you can you can look at it at your leisure. Um, so I, I want I want to spend the rest of the time touching upon some of the OFI extensions that we have put in place, and there are also some backup slides that have some examples. And I mean, in, if if there is some time left, I may be able to cover them. But again, if not, the slides will be distributed, and you can take a look at it. Uh, any, any questions so far before we jump into the ex the, the details of the extension OFI extensions? Thank you. So then you can go to the next slide. Yeah. So, so one of the uh, important contributions of our work is that we we currently actually have a reasonably fully featured OFI provider in place. Um, so, so we have been able to run a, a specific middleware. Uh, currently, we have deployed it, and then we are in the process of actually making sure MPI and Shmem also is functional. There are some little bit of changes that we need, but but it's work in progress and I think we should be able to get that also completed. So once we have that, we should be able to open up this interface for I mean, any arbitrary MPI or, or Shmem applications. Um, and more, one of the key message here is that there were no new OFI functions that were added to this work. So everything was based on existing fields uh, everything was uses the existing flags or some of the uh, some of the parameters, and all we did was to extend the semantics to support this inline and look aside acceleration model. And as part of it, we did define some new flags, but but that, that again can be overlaid as part of the existing flags. Um, of course, what whatever we are positioning out here is not not considered official OFI support. It's 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 a, it's a, it's our own 
version of how potentially OFI could be extended. So treat this as such, treat this as like a temporary temporary enhancements until it becomes part of official OFI. And again, we are we work closely with uh, some of the OFI folks, including Sean on this on this effort. So let's let's see where that leads to. But as of now, you can think of it as a, as an internal uh, uh, prototype, and currently it, it supports all all possible interfaces, uh, right from messaging and RMA and so on. So I'll, I'll not I'll not get into those details right now. So so but the key takeaway is that no new OFI functions. Everything uses existing OFI parameters, and we have just extended the semantics. Uh, next slide, please. So so this is this one is about how we went about um, providing this acceleration support. So for acceleration support, there are two ways we can actually do it. One is we can enable it on a per operation basis. The second option is we can enable it on a per endpoint basis. So if I have some time, I can go into the backup slides where you can see as part of a, for instance, the FI write operation, there is a context field that's that's part of standard OFI, which we actually use and overload it and provide some of the acceleration uh, uh, parameters. So, 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 so once we associate an endpoint as being acceleration capable, then essentially we end up specifying the 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 um, the, 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 the specific values in in terms of the acceleration flags. And these acceleration flags, as I mentioned earlier, can be set for each endpoint object, and then you can essentially invoke it for the different data moment operation. Um, so there are certain couple of uh, OFI functions like uh, FI write message and FI read message that is mentioned here, where you don't necessarily have to enable it on a, uh, on, a, on, a on an endpoint basis. So it actually has this additional parameter where you can actually invoke it on a per operation basis. So that, that option is also available. So next slide. The accelerator outputs itself, the Data field that we are using is this uh, data uh, as part of the completion uh, queue data entry uh, structure. And currently, this is actually used at the receive side in OFI. So what what we have done is we are also using it at the send side. So when so there are, there are two two ways it can be used at on the send. One is like when you invoke a acceleration operation, the result of the operation can be readily be made available to the sender. So the completion data. On the sender side, can be immediately post be immediately be posted, and then you may also want to get a completion once the full end-to-end -end reliability is completed and the day complete operation has been successfully flagged. So there's a there's a possibility of getting two completion operations on the transmit side, and in addition, of course, on the receive side, you can still get a completion operation as as part of the standard receive side completion, and the the data is going to be posted along with the necessary fields on the on the receive side as well. So, so what we are doing is we are overloading this or extending the semantics of this data field to contain the accelerated result. Next slide, please. This one is on the lookaside acceleration, and as I alluded earlier, it's it's independently invoked. Um, the standard FI write, FI read, everything contains all the necessary information for invoking this accelerator along with the necessary remote uh, parameter destination parameters um, current our current hardware implementation is as doesn't fully support this model so what we have done is there's a little bit of additional work that is needed at the, at the software level so the way software currently works is if you recall the hardware overview slide we have two separate command queues hardware i mean software would post it into the accelerator command queue first Along with the type of uh, accelerator operation that needs to be invoked, and then once the data is once the operation is completed, then it would post a completion like what I mentioned in the previous slide, and then the software would see the completion and post the command into the transmit command queue. Notice that the data itself will still reside in this domain. It'll not be it'll not be sloshing back and forth between the accelerator domain and the CPU domain. So so all software does is like uh, does a sort of a, a management where it actually ends up sending the same pointer that is residing inside the accelerator domain and tell the transmit part of it to send the data out. Sometime in the future, we'll, we'll integrate it to a point where software doesn't have to, to do the second work where it actually has to invoke the lookaside accelerator separately, and then also it needs to invoke the transmit accelerators, uh, transmit operation separately. So that's something which uh, is, is, will be completed in the future. 
so this gives you a sort of a good good overview and and if, if time permits i can i think i might have like a couple of extra minutes so if you if you don't mind going maybe perhaps to the last slide before we go to slide 15 i can just uh, the last slide as in the back okay maybe if you can skip like three more slides i uh, just want to show the one more slide please one more yeah thanks so this is a so this, this gives you a I mean, better context of how we are using it so so i mentioned earlier uh, for instance the fi write operation itself how we are overloading the context so here you can see the context itself is again a user defined context and the context is overloaded by specifying the type of accelerator function that needs to be invoked. So if you look up, you can see that the specific type of accelerator that, that is currently being invoked in this operation is a, is a CRC operation. And then we are providing some initial input to the accelerator functions. It's just some seed value that we are providing. And then the, the invocation, the FI write operation itself has, has not been changed at all. So it's just the same as what, what it's being done right now. And inside the COPA provider and the lib hardware and the COPA hardware, we'll end up taking care of how to interpret this context and, and invoking the specific accelerator operation. So, so this, this should give you a sort of a, I mean, uh, I mean uh, illustrate how, how we are using it for, in terms of uh, uh, using, I mean, using it for some of our invocation models. So I think I'll, I'll stop here and then go back to the closing remarks in like three slides earlier and then. I can wait for more questions. Thank you. So the next next one, please. Thanks. So so as as we discussed in this presentation, uh, traditional accelerator IP APIs like OpenCL are not really meant to scale across multiple nodes, and they are not architected to support networking. So OFI is the best bet here. Um, so what we have done is we have take we have taken OFI and use that OFI and provided minimal extensions. And then I've built a provider that exposes these accelerator capabilities. And uh, we think we have, we have actually validated it on a fully functional uh, COPA FPGA cluster. So we have validated both inline and look-aside accelerator implications. And we have actually achieved full wire speed. We have been able to run at 100 gigabits per second in terms of doing both the network transmit receive operation as well as invoking the accelerator inline accelerator on the fly. And so overall, the, this work has actually proved that OFI can indeed provide a unified interface for both acceleration as well as networking. So I'll, I'll stop here and then open up the floor for additional questions. And I also have my colleagues, uh, Olivier and Mike Bloxham on the call. So if there are some other questions, they can also uh, answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Venkata. Let's just give a minute for questions to come in. In the meantime, I'm going to um, open the mic for Michael and uh, Olivier in case they would like to add any comments. Okay. All right, so there is Paul Gruen who will be, I guess, chiming in with some comments. Paul, go ahead, try to unmute and uh, speak. Try again. There, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Yeah. On, on slide 49, um, you discussed the headless node, which is an intriguing concept. The idea of a node that has really essentially no software behind it. But doesn't it, you know, how far along are you in your thinking with that? It seems like there'd be a raft of issues that you would need to overcome. For example, somebody on the network somewhere has to be able to discover that resource and allocate it uh, to consumers somewhere. Um, it seems like you would have to do things like, like the moral equivalent of extending, you know, an FI get info kind of an operation across the fabric to discover this thing. So what's your thinking about the headless node? How, how far along is the thinking there? Uh, I mean, uh, at this point in time, Mike and Chip later after I'm done. Um, at this point in time, we have validated it as, as, as if it's not a multi-tenant environment. Um, so what we have what we have currently put in place is that a specific application that is running on the entire cluster can invoke that accelerator on the on the remote node. Um, so in terms of uh, security, in terms of partitioning, that would be our next step. And uh, yeah, that's that's actually a very important question, and that 
we intend to address in the future. Um, but, but even in the single consumer environment, that consumer would have to be able to discover the fact that this accelerator existed across the fabric somehow, and it would have to be able to configure it in some way, wouldn't it? Uh, currently, for a specific application, there are certain set of services that are essential for that particular application. So we we are currently assuming that it's already pre-configured. And in terms of the uh, um, the availability of, of of these different type of accelerator services, we are configuring it in a static manner. But eventually, we need to have along the lines of what Bernard mentioned in terms of having a, a, a manager. Uh, resource manager, which can actually discover what type of services are available and then list it all out in a, in a, in a way where the management software can understand it and then provide it as part of uh, part of the capabilities on the fabric level. All this is not at being done yet. Okay, and to go hand in hand with that, then there has to be at least enough intelligence on that headless node to be able to receive the queries from that manager wherever it is and respond to them, right? That's what you're correct, thinking. Correct, it's a target. So it can understand the packets coming in. It can it can interpret what, what the packet says, and then it can invoke the operation then and there. And additionally, when I say a headless node, this is not to exclude the possibility of having a small management CPU, which can do all the, all the necessary initialization. In fact, one of the uh, deployments that we have done again as a POC is to actually have a management CPU. What this is conveying is that it can it can it can act like a sort of a dumb target. There's, there's really it won't be initiating the operation using OFI running on the on the on the on the headless node, but it can respond to the information. But at the same time, it can participate in terms of the management setup. Okay, makes sense. Gotta be careful there that you you want that to be a you know a low a low capability CPU in order to discourage people from you know begin to stack <laughs> the natural inclination. Correct, indeed. Yes, I agree. Yes, yes, that, that's definitely the case. <laughs> yeah, we are thinking of some very small soft core process uh, to to do that. Like we already have our RDMA uh, hardware protocol implemented on the FPGA, we need, just need something like that configure the connection table on that monitor the connection, so it can be very very low power, like eight bits of core processor could even do it for us. Yes. Another distinction is that um, one of the earlier slides, Venk had a, the SOC diagram, you know, and that's sort of headless, right? But we still have a processor and we're still running OFI software, but um, it would be configured so that it could be the, the, the target of acceleration. I think that's the key point. So when it, when it pulls a packet off of the fabric, it would do an acceleration right there without invoking any kind of software and then return a response. But there would still be OFI and software uh, running and, and kind of setting things up. So that would be like a step in between a, a fully autonomous, fully, you know, only hardware, no, no, no processors, uh, kind of a head, headless node. So. Right, and in the fullness of time, you can imagine some minor extensions to OFI, the lid fabric, on the consumer side to help him uh, be able to discover, you know, the resource which used to be local to his node and which is now located across the fabric. You know, again, the, the, the analogy that occurs to me is some sort of a, you know, FI get info across the fabric function. And I can see where that might be a, a useful thing sometime in the future, depending on how this all, all works out. Okay. Uh, in the interest of time, I am going to um, have you guys take any questions offline. I'm going to go to the new session, the next session, I mean. Um, looks like um, it's 9.20, so we are eating into break. Um, we may get a shorter break than usual. i uh, guessing that is okay, given we are all very close to our, um, I guess, needs to take a break, the places where we need to go. <laughs> All right, so the next speaker, 